Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 133, Unlock Your Expressive Gifts for Optimum Interpretation with Mimi Stillman. Flute 360 is launching two innovative classes to help you thrive in today's climate. Do you find yourself wanting a space for your unique voice, ideas, and offerings to be heard? Unfortunately, in our current times, a lot of in-person opportunities have been lost. Because of this, I am encouraging you to consider digital opportunities for yourself and your business. I am offering two four-week classes titled The Podcasting Musician. Create your music podcast on a low budget to amplify your voice and offerings. In these classes, we will build your podcast from the ground up. Podcasting has been growing steadily for the last 15 years, and it continues to soar even during a pandemic. Remote classes begin on November 3rd and December 15th, 2020. Register today at HeidiKBegay.com slash The Podcasting Musician. See you soon. Hi, Mimi. Welcome to the show. Hi, Heidi. Thanks for having me on Flute 360. Oh, for sure. It's my pleasure. Thanks for carving out time out of your busy day to speak with us, and I can't wait to pick your brain. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm really delighted to ha- chat with you, and, and we just, in our, in our pre-interview chat, um, recollected where we first met in Arizona years ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was a lifetime ago. It was 2007, and I was a senior undergrad at the University of Arizona in Tucson studying with Dr. Brian Lewis, and you were the guest artist for the weekend. That's right. And I had a great time, and Brian uh, had me in to do the recital and masterclass residency, and it was uh, really fun to to work with uh, everyone there and, and to get to meet you. But it's been a, a long while, so it's nice to at least catch up by phone. Yeah, 13 years. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, counting, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> we haven't aged yeah. a bit. <laughs> oh, shoot. So how have you been doing and what's been going on in your neck of the woods? Well, thank you. It's been a really difficult 2020 because of the pandemic, of course, and, and my heart goes out to everybody who's been affected by COVID-19. It's just so tragic. But of course, the other layer after trying to stay well for all of us is just the effect that it's had on the arts and on so many other industries. But, you know, speaking as a musician, just having so many concert cancellations and everything and, and luckily a shift to online, um, it's made me grateful for technology in different ways because I've been, you know, performing and live streaming and teaching, um, which we could get into a little bit more through the internet, of course, but it's just a lot of uncertainty, right, about how our business is going to look after the pandemic. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I agree. My heart went out to everybody too, music friends and music colleagues, and you just see it through social media, right? I mean, everybody's just, uh, there's so much heartache and pain and questioning. And so you really take a step back and reflect and you're right. Like, you know, find those things that you are, you know, blessed to have in your life. And you think, oh, wow, I'm really, you just really take those small things, you know, even just small meet and greets, right? And you look back and you think, oh, wow, like I don't take those for granted anymore. Very much so. And and I've really been reflecting on that because um, there was about a six month period from when everything stopped in March. I was on tour with my duo pianist of many years, Charlie Abramovic. And we were at Yamaha's Music for All Festival in Indiana, which got canceled just after we arrived and we were sent home. And before that, uh, some engagements I had in Asia had already been canceled, of course, because I was actually going to go to Korea for a festival just as the virus was spreading from China through um, Asia and Europe kind of in February. And so that didn't happen, but we went home and then there was probably almost seven months before I got to play with other 
colleagues again. And it was really incredible because I've never taken playing music for granted. I've always felt very blessed to do it. I've always felt very motivated, thankfully, to practice, to rehearse. And But on, on some level, you can't help take it for granted, right? Because making music with people is what we do. So that was really difficult, but I did feel even more blessed to gradually come back to some first outdoor playing and performing and recording with people and getting ready for my first indoor recording with some Dolce Suono Ensemble colleagues. That's the ensemble of which I'm founding artistic director this week. So that'll be really great. But but just what you're saying about not taking even little things for granted is so true. My family and I just got back home to Philadelphia from Virginia, where we celebrated my niece's bat mitzvah ceremony. And that was just so meaningful, so exciting. Um, it's a big milestone in her life, in all our lives. Uh, but especially we were so thankful to be together for it. And we had to do it with a lot of safety protocols, which which I hope worked. But anyway, it was, it was you know extra special to be together for that. Mm, congratulations. Thank you so much, Heidi. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, I'm glad you brought this up because this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, <laughs> you mentioned COVID and being a musician and not taking, you know, those um, recitals or performances for granted. I wonder how much more um, we as musicians are going to be even more expressive through our playing because of COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, being pulled apart, you know, having six, seven plus months not getting together to play. And then when we are reunited, how much more magical the music is going to speak. Exactly. I, I think you put it so well. I think that there's something always about making music, which means kind of living in the moment or trying to make the moment of every piece that we play as beautiful as possible. But that that element of spontaneity only happens when we're really together, which is why, of course, having the coronavirus pandemic just, just strikes at the heart of what we do. If we're not safely together, feeling natural, and then, of course, being able to feed off from the energy we get from audiences, mm. um, there's something really different. I've been live streaming solo flute recitals with talking, my series called Tea with Mimi. I started it kind of early on in the lockdown. Um, so I was at home in Philadelphia and just thought I would, from my living room, play for audiences that I am not able to play for live, that my ensemble is not able to perform for. And it was so surprising because it really brought out a global audience, which was nice and helped me feel connected to folks musically. But of course, playing in a room where you know it's kind of being transmitted through internet is not the same as playing in a room with people for people with that energy so yeah so it kind of an answer to your question I wonder if we will all feel ever more blessed to be doing it I think probably I think the the flip side is a lot of people are definitely going through issues with feeling motivated to practice with such an uncertain future or such a surprisingly empty calendar whether you're a student or professional I think that's something that many are struggling with Oh, for sure. It's so yeah. hard to find that motivation to practice when that calendar is empty. Because it's so mm -hmm. easy to say, oh, I have a concert or I have a recital on X day. And then you plan out those 30, you know, 60 days or whatever. But when those events have been deleted, definitely inspiration is hard to come by. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I feel kind of funny saying this, but I actually always love to practice. And uh, so I'm, maybe I'm very fortunate that I'm not feeling unmotivated, but there are, are obviously dips because if you are looking forward to your whole entire season plan and it's not happening, that's definitely a bump. But I know dealing with it in, in different ways or um, talking to some of my students about that issue has definitely been something that many struggle with. And we're just trying to think of ways to stay motivated and to try, try to use this time of isolation as a way to have the sort of solitude to reflect on music or find ways that we can still get better. Even if it means Zoom lessons with those limitations instead of in-person lessons, you know, we can still get better. And I'm thinking, how can I get better? Right. And as well as trying to support what my students are doing. And most of them are just doing such a great job with that. Mm, that's wonderful. So before we get into today's content, if you could please share with the listeners a little bit about yourself, that would be great. 
Yes, Heidi, happy to. I perform as a soloist and chamber musician, and I love giving concerts uh, all around the United States and internationally, um, whether it's recitals, concertos with orchestra or chamber music. And I'm also a recording artist and um, really have enjoyed making several albums and with more in the pipeline. And I'm also founding artistic director of Dolce Suono Ensemble, which is a chamber music ensemble based in Philadelphia. And we have a lot of wide ranging activities. We have a core of artists. I often liken it to a repertory theater company where you have the core of performers who come in and out of projects depending on uh, the programming there. And a lot of us are my fellow graduates of the Curtis Institute of Music. So I studied at Curtis with Julius Baker and Jeffrey Kaner, two marvelous teachers. It was uh, the late legendary flutist Julius Baker who brought me to study with him when I was 12. Hmm. So, so far, I think my record still stands of youngest wind player accepted at Curtis. And so that was really, really formative um, because I met so many friends and lifelong colleagues and my ensemble is comprised of a lot of Curtis people sort of from different times but it's a bit of a musical family so a lot of our artists are like me chamber solo people or orchestra members some of our core artists are in Philadelphia Orchestra Metropolitan Opera Orchestra Baltimore Symphony Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia Opera Philadelphia and just other other ensembles as well as uh, members of Dolce Suono Ensemble so and teachers um, like me as well so we have a lot of fun performing our DSC Presents home series in Philadelphia as well as touring recording a large part of what I do both as soloist and chamber musician at the helm of Dolce Suono Ensemble is commissioning new works so we gave the world premieres of 54 new pieces in our 15 seasons. Unfortunately, we finished um, the past season was our 15th and it was going to be really, really festive. And of course, uh, COVID-19 had other plans for us, unfortunately. So we are kind of postponing our big celebration, but still uh, really happy to be entering the 16th season, even if it looks completely different from what we expected. And we also have a really strong educational outreach and community engagement part of what we do and what I feel very passionate about, um, especially with the Latino community of Philadelphia. So we have a project called Musica en Tus Manos, or Music in Your Hands, uh, for which we won a night foundation night arts challenge in 2013 and have kept it going and so it combines performance of chamber music and popular music from latin america and spain plus engaging the community at bilingual events because i grew up speaking spanish Hmm. as well it's so interesting to hear about this spanish flared recital um is there anything more that you want to share about that Huh. Well, I also had the gift of growing up with another language because my parents are authors of textbooks and books for learning foreign languages, especially Spanish and French. And so growing up in Boston, they made Spanish the language of our house. And my mm-hmm. older brother um, was bilingual by the time I came around. And so I actually spoke only Spanish for the first three years of my speaking life and then mm-hmm. added English. And so I tried to stay very active uh, using Spanish, both in the home and with friends and when I travel and uh, especially perform in Spanish speaking countries. And that absolutely Absolutely influenced our decision with the ensemble to do Musica en Tus Manos and to work with the Latino community. And so that's been a really nice way of combining kind of my, my home life and experience with Spanish language and culture with my musical world. But I think also I was very much influenced by having um, professor and author PhD parents with a love for the humanities in general. Um, because they had also, you know, studied linguistics and history and literature. And so after I graduated with my bachelor's in music from Curtis, I continued on for a master's in history at the University of Pennsylvania. Hmm. And 
I loved it so much. I had just absolutely fantastic professors and learned a great deal just while performing full time. So I actually stayed on into the PhD program, which I didn't finish the rather large paper at the end of it. So I'm actually all but dissertation, but just really had a great enriching experience that then fed back into what I do with music. So a lot of my projects and programs as a soloist and as a chamber musician with my Dolce Suono Ensemble combine music and history or let's say set music in its broadest intellectual and cultural context. So I'm always learning and and hopefully our audiences, I I think, feel that way too in terms of having a lot of intellectual and history, high protein stuff enriching it. And I really enjoy doing the writing, whether it's program notes, album notes, articles about music and history. And so actually one thing that we're going to be launching at this time in the season of 2020, 2021, since we're not as an ensemble able to just present our regular live concerts due to coronavirus, um, we're launching a lecture series series online that will be very interesting, just inviting people to go deeper with us on the music and history content on some themes that I really love talking about. So I'll be giving uh, a series of online lectures with musical examples. And so that should be a very interesting journey, um, hopefully providing extra context for when we get back into the concert hall in the regular way. Oh, how wonderful. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. So yeah, please Stay tuned on that. I should have some updates soon. Yeah. So when do those launch? I think we're going to launch at the beginning of 2021, just kind of working out some of the production aspects and how I want to deliver those lectures. Um, But I think it's going to be maybe six of them from January through June. Okay. It's looking like. Yeah. I did hear you say the beginning of 2021. I swear I'm listening. I just didn't know if there was like a specific date that you had in mind. Oh, gotcha. You know, not yet. I think uh, I think we're going to work that out and then probably announce it very soon. So that's kind of a very new development, but yeah. Oh, cool. Well, when you do have the specific dates, please let me know and I will definitely update the show notes for your episode. Thank you, Heidi. That would be awesome because yeah, I always feel whatever happens there's this kind of internet social media thing where people find out but I really appreciate your being so detailed with that because it would be great to have the information there perfect so outside of your recording projects and all of that that you just listed so beautifully um, what else are you involved with right now yes I love teaching and it's always been a really important part of what I do in addition to performing and the scholarship. And so I'm on faculty at uh, Temple University, where I have a marvelous flute studio of undergrads and grads in flute. And I've just started my fourth year of that um, all online for now, but we can't wait to be safely together in person. I'm also on the faculty at my alma mater, Curtis Institute of Music Summerfest programs for young artists in high school and college and for adult musicians teaching flute and new music and chamber music. And I'm also, as a Yamaha performing artist and clinician, on faculty at Yamaha's music for all festival, um, which gets together every year. And uh, also just really enjoy and find it so stimulating to teach flute master classes when I'm on the road, um, often doing residencies at universities or flute societies. And in addition to working with flutists, um, it's really such a joy to coach chamber music and work with young composers on writing for the flute and writing chamber music with flute. That's a very stimulating part of it. So I think um, between the performing and the teaching and the writing, um, I also make arrangements and have done improvisation, mostly in Latin styles and Mozart cadenzas, and have only composed one piece that I actually perform publicly, but it's something I'd like to do more of perhaps. So I'm very fortunate to have a a diverse uh, set of outlets in music and really always feel that I, I keep learning and growing as well as sharing music with others. Wow, what a busy schedule. <laughs> I need to sit back and like re-examine what I'm doing because, oh my goodness, I don't see how you have time for all of these wonderful projects. 
<laughs> Gee, thanks. Well, you know, you're hardly a slouch doing all that you do with performing and teaching and, and this marvelous podcast, Heidi. But I mean, I guess that the good thing is no two days are alike. So that keeps me always on my toes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, shoot. So um, thank you for that um, background and what a rich history you've come from. And thank you for sharing, you know, just a little bit about yourself. I so enjoyed listening to it all. At the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University, you will receive the artistic training and career preparation needed to become a 21st century artist an education that will show you how to not only find opportunities, but to create them and make them your own. For 160 years, Peabody has been focused on excellence and innovation in the performing arts and leading the way in developing artists for a changing world. Peabody is a community that builds on time-tested traditions while pushing the boundaries and creating new standards in music and dance programs. Peabody offers degrees in flute performance at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels, as well as a performer certificate, artist diploma, and graduate performance diploma. Their world-renowned flute faculty includes Marina Piccinini, Erica Peel, and Aaron Goldman. Learn more at peabody.jhu.edu. So the month of October, I've been talking with artists like you on how we can be more expressive through our flute as musicians. So before we get into your approach, what does playing expressively mean to you? I think it's great that you're doing this theme because essentially being expressive is is the foundational part of being a musician and, and communicating. And also, it's really good to start with definitions. I definitely picked up in grad school, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, for me, being expressive or performing with expression means a way of communicating the mood character and emotion of whatever piece of music that we're playing. It's really about playing with feeling mm. and it's about the, the interpretation of the music coming organically from the music itself and from the score. And I think it's also what brings out in our performance, the uniqueness of every piece. Definitely. Yes. I couldn't agree more. You said that so beautifully. So if a student comes to you and walks through the Mimi Stillman studio and you notice that he or she is having a really difficult time in this area, how do you help them? Yes, this actually, I think, speaks so much to the heart of what we try to do as musicians, whether we're performing or teaching or in any, any role. And I think very much as a teacher, my approach to the pedagogy has to do with giving a student the tools to find a way of interpreting music on their own. So, of course, a lot of what we do is incredibly disciplined and detailed, and it's about drill and it's about technique. Um, but I think at the same time, um, technique and expression should really be approached together or holistically, right? So that I try to help students learn technical aspects and interpretative expressive aspects at the same time in their approach. And, and I guess before, before we get into the, the deep how is that done, I guess it really emanates from a deeper approach to music because I think music um, occurs on so many different levels. Of course, it, it happens intellectually, about the study of music and the study of the composer and the biography of, of, of him or her or the style and the period and all that historical stuff and then getting into the score itself with analysis and theory. And then there's the level, of course, of practice mm. and rehearsal and kind of learning the, each piece from inside. And then all these things that we've been studying influence the decision-making on certain aspects of the interpretation. And this leads to 
obviously, hopefully, incredibly well-prepared performances from all these different layers of preparation. And then another really important layer to performing expressively is this idea of the spontaneity, um, Mm -hmm. the magic that happens in concert and and the things that you can't plan for, but that are fed by all this slow work. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's something I try to transmit to students, just the, the very many layers of understanding each piece of music in context and historical context that would then lead to the most expressive performance we can do. Mm, Nice. So my question, like to piggyback off of what you just said in, Mm -hmm. in being spontaneous in performance, do you practice that spontaneity before you get on stage? Ooh, that's a really great question because it's kind of like, at what point do you realize your inspiration has just taken you over, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> one way I, I, I like to think about it is that you do a lot of thinking in advance um, and you do a lot of your technique work all in the practice room and in the rehearsal room so that when you're on stage, hopefully you can think about interpretative and expressive things rather than the actual technique. And then of course, there are moments where you have to remind yourself, take a deep breath here or don't be too sharp here or that kind of thing. But hopefully it's really the preparation that lets you be spontaneous in the moment. And I think um, absolutely in terms of I guess a couple layers of the spontaneity, um, rehearsal and practice is absolutely the time to try things expressively. Mm -hmm. And that could be tempo choice or dynamic schemes. Mm -hmm. One thing that I always tell students is actually we have to push the envelope in practice and in rehearsal to see if maybe there's an expressive idea we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, I love, yeah, I love that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, I don't know, you know, if the mood strikes you and you just really want to play that pianissimo, like, you know, extra pianissimo or whatever. Um, if yeah. you don't push the envelope in the practice room and you don't know the limits, right, then how can you go there as an artist if it hasn't yeah. been experienced beforehand? I so agree with you. And actually, I I am reminded of this anecdote of the great pianist, Glenn Gould, who famously recorded Bach's Goldberg variations at two very different tempos at two different times in his life. And in general, was known for being someone who really pushed boundaries um, musically on many levels. And sometimes um, my duo pianist and I, uh, this is Charles Abramovic, who I've been playing with for I think just over 18 years or something, we will say, let's try a Glenn Gould tempo here, or let's really try a different sort of really different thing and see what we learn from it. Cause sometimes it'll be an idea that you don't end up keeping as mm. your plan, but maybe it will influence your plan for that moment in the piece. And that's another thing that I tell students and that I do myself, which is if you're playing in a chamber ensemble and I, I love chamber music. I mean, I devote, in addition to solo, a large part of my creative life and my Dolce Swan Ensemble is chamber music. One thing that's really important is whenever someone has an idea, try the idea. Never say no until you've tried it. And part of that's etiquette and part of that's just this wonderful world of musical exploration. Hmm. Yeah. No, no idea is too silly to try. Yes. Right. And, um, Actually, I don't know how you want to do musical examples, Heidi, um, but do you want me to weave them in? Like if I have an idea and I demo something? Oh my goodness, Mimi, you can play as much as you want. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to do a demonstration right now on a particular excerpt or something, I'd love it. So I was just talking about um, in both in my teaching and then, of course, in my own practice, both for solo and chamber repertoire, I think it's great sometimes to try more extreme interpretation ideas than you might end up deciding are right for you, but it really helps learn about the music. And I think also hearkening back to what I said about how we want to be expressive in order to capture the uniqueness of every piece. Sometimes that's really a question of um, getting to know the style. Like why do I choose a certain tempo for Bach versus a certain tempo for Mozart? And of course it's very different in Foray or Jolivet or Copeland. And so one example maybe w- would be helpful to think about is trying different tempos in something by Bach, because I think so much of our approach to Bach has to be informed by 
studying his style and Baroque style and then understanding, I think, the, the importance of the meter itself to making decisions about tempo. Obviously, Bach was pre-metronome, so a lot of that falls to us. But luckily, there are a lot of treatises and, and texts that we can use as well as just wonderful recordings of people playing Bach so beautifully. But because we're flutists and some of the best works are Bach masterworks, um, I think it's a great place to spend a lot of time as we think about expression and artistry. So one thing that I like to think about for Bach is dance forms. Um, dance movements are really important, both in the partita, where each movement is actually a dance form, but also in the sonatas, because many of them have dance elements that influence how we approach not just te tempo choice, but overall mood, articulation, dynamics, and, and feeling for each movement. So one idea would be from just starting Bach partita, the Alemanda movement. <laughs> I just played it a basic tempo that I like, but it came from thinking about the Alemanda as a Baroque dance known as a stately dance in common time. So four beats per measure, but more commonly felt with a sort of grand two beats per measure. And um, it sounds great at a variety of tempos. And I think that I keep changing probably my tempo a little bit in every performance as I keep rethinking it. But that said, let's do a little exercise where I might try a much faster tempo and see what happens and then a much slower tempo. So I'm going to try faster first, just for a little bit of the Alamanda. And I should say, bear in mind that at the time of Bach, this was concert music. It was no longer actually danced. Some of these dance forms were actually danced by people dancing um, maybe in the 17th century, but not in around 1720 or so when Bach wrote this. So here's going to be a quite a bit faster Alamanda feel and we could see what we feel about it. <laughs> So that is faster than I've performed it, but I felt it definitely had a lot of internal energy. Now I'm going to do uh, the opposite, and I'm going to go to a very stately, almost slow two beats per measure feeling for the Alamanda, probably slower than I've ever performed it, and see what happens. <laughs> And of course that goes on and that definitely felt stately. I felt a sense of the grandeur of it, but I think it was harder for me to have the sort of internal rhythmic propulsion. So I think I learned something from both of those extreme tempos. Let's call them extreme tempos. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to try for is the energy of the fast one, but the grandeur of the second one. I'm going to imagine um, tapping into a sort of majestic cosmic pendulum that I feel mostly two beats per measure and try for perhaps a tempo I might like better. And then we can see what you like. <laughs> okay. okay. And then more and so forth. So, yeah, I was a little bit more convinced by that one myself. <laughs> Yeah, I love how you just brought us into your process. I love the fact that you said, okay, I learned something from the extreme Tempe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I loved how you saw it as, okay, I love the energy of the faster tempo, but then I love the grandness from the slow tempo. And then finding that healthy, happy medium, and then bringing those traits into the, the medium tempo. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you appreciated it. it. It definitely felt like my process and you had asked about teaching. So I definitely sometimes talk students through that same sort of process of experimentation. And then we talk about what we like and what we want to take into the, the working plan tempo, let's say, if it's if it's a question of tempo. Yeah. And I think us as teachers, it's so important for us to give our students permission to experiment. And mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm hearing from you. 
Yes, my beloved teacher, the late legendary Julius Baker, who was like another grandfather figure for me because he brought me to Curtis when I was 12. And he was already in his late 70s at that point, but still playing with the glorious Baker sound in every lesson those first years and through a lot of duets. But um, one thing that he loved to say um, to his students is, you are your own best teacher. And that was very characteristic of Mr. Baker in the sense that he would he would be terse. He would say those kinds of short sayings sometimes, but that had so much deep wisdom inside and that I'm still unpacking because I think that's very true in the sense that we are with our teacher maybe an hour a week when we're students or maybe more. But we are always our own artist or in the process of becoming the best artist that we can be. So I think this idea of trying to help students have the tools to come up with their own decisions based on knowledge is some of the best things. And I was very lucky to have teachers that gave me that, both Julius Baker and Jeffrey Kaner at Curtis. Mm. Mm. I love mm-hmm. that. And you're mm-hmm. right, you know, even as professionals, isn't it so true? Um, and I love how open you were to that statement. We're still unpacking the things that they say. You know, even after, you know, my last studies with Lisa, you know, even a year or two later, I'm like, oh, I get it. That's what she was trying to tell me. And, you know, it comes full circle. And I love that you're finding or you found that to be true at some point in your career. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's nice to hear you say that because I feel like as artists, we have the great blessing of being able to learn our entire life. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah. So, uh, so I always learn a lot from teaching. Do, you must learn a lot from teaching. I know you're a very de- devoted teacher, Heidi. Yeah. Um, I just love what my students teach me. You mm-hmm. know, sometimes exactly. the things that come out of my mouth, I go, whoa. And I take a step back. And I'm like, I actually needed to hear that today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. so we're in it together for sure. Mm-hmm. That's a wonderful approach. So with how you just talked about like experimenting, right, with the tempi there and mm-hmm. what, what did that do for the partita and, you know, et cetera, is that your approach to, I mean, we were talking about layers, right? There's so many different right. layers to music. So is that the approach you apply within your own practicing Yeah. So I I guess um, in my own practice, absolutely. It's a combination of the study and the experimentation. And of course, it really depends on the style. So I mentioned dance forms, for example, in approach to Bach. Mozart is obviously some of our greatest music, but the concertos and the quartets, and then of course, orchestral parts. And for me, interpretation of Mozart is very special, especially because lately in the past few years, I've come to writing and also improvising my own cadenzas, which has added, uh, well, a very daunting project on the one hand, but a lot of learning for me um, to get to that point where you're improvising on Mozart. And of course, you always feel like you're going to make it worse when I when I add my voice uh, to Mozart. But in terms of a large part of my thinking of expression has been living with the Mozart concerti and, and revisiting each time I perform um, from any standpoints. And I think in terms of the expression, one thing that comes up in really all flute music has to do with the connection of the flute with the human voice. And I am so inspired by listening to vocal music and listening to great singers and playing with great singers that that's a huge part of how I think about the way I'm making the line, the all important phrase. So for example, in a Mozart concerto that will come up really throughout because it's a certain type of tone that we want to use that sort of combines a brightness and a darkness in in all sorts of music. So if you're playing, oh, the rondo of the G major concerto, you'll think about dances, the minuet, but definitely want that sparkle. So I'll try to anchor into that dance feel and um, singing feel in my tone. And then especially very vividly in, for example, 
slow movements that we have in Mozart, um, the second movement of the D major concerto. For me, the interpretation um, that I think about is very much informed by listening to Mozart arias because of Mozart's role as an opera composer at a time when opera was considered the foremost genre in 18th century Europe. And so when I come in for this movement, I'm really thinking very vocally with mm -hmm. what I do with my breathing, air, and phrasing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just as one example of some of the thinking that I do going into expression for myself, then of course, as a teacher, but really, if, if you want to break it down into some of the things that go into playing expressively, fundamentally, the idea of phrase, most notes in any piece are going somewhere or coming from somewhere. And so it's Understanding the line is really important. And then our tools such as dynamics and tone color and timbre are also extremely important. Hmm. Yeah. And it kind of brings, it goes back to what you're saying initially in the beginning of the interview, just, mm -hmm. you know, giving your students those tools. If they don't know how to play louder or softer, or if they don't know how to wiggle their fingers, maybe, you know, faster, or whatever, then how are they going to be able to express themselves? Yes. And so I really emphasize uh, exercises as part of my own practice and also what I do with my students, because that, that way we build our technique so that we can do in the music anything our imagination uh, comes up with expressively. Mm, that's great. <laughs> so you mentioned vocalists. Are there any other artists out there? And it can be outside of music, um, authors or sculptors, you name it. Any other artists you admire within this, ex <laughs> <laughs> within this expression realm? Yeah, I, I laugh because you've made the mistake of starting to ask me some of my favorite artists and things that inspire me, because then this could be a very long talk. <laughs> Indeed, I, I've always really loved visual art, was exposed to a lot growing up in my family and art history. And I remember being, I don't know, maybe a seven or eight year old child and discovering French flute music and learning it with um, the piece of music on my stand and a uh, Monet painting on the other side on my stand or a book of art. And so I've always been very inspired by impressionist art at the same time as French flute music. And then that went on to, to I think, feed into my interest very organically in WC, both as a musician and historian. And so, yeah, French art in general, but so, so many old masters and newer masters inspire me. There's so many performers that I learn from, um, and I think it's really excellent as as a flutist to listen to other instrumentalists and vocalists and opera and orchestra and just everything we can really will inform our style but that said um some singers all-time favorites include renee fleming and dame janet baker i just return to those and others all the time um lately um might be it might be a best way to answer what i've been listening to just recently so that um i don't rattle off just tons of of wonderful artists but lately i've been listening to great russian violinists such mm -hmm. as high fits um who's been a lifelong favorite um also david oistrock recently growing more familiar with the artistry of Leonid Kogan. And I've been just really in the mood for some great Russian music. So in the past week or so, there's been a lot of Tchaikovsky, Glazunov and more over here, but it changes. I, I'm inspired by a lot of different things. Oh, cool. I love the story you just gave about the Monet painting on your music stand, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. tapping into the colors or the impressionistic style. How amazing would that be to translate that into the music you're playing? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think this kind of visual element is has been very vivid, literally, for playing French music, because, of course, as flutists, so much of our great stuff is late 19th century French music through 20th century. So we're looking at from the Romantic period, Tafanel and Gobert, 
their exercises, of course, revolutionizing how we play flute, but also um, Tafanel's commissions of foray and, you know, Gan, Shamanad, uh, Hue, that sort of first generation of more sort of concours once they started changing every year. We have all these new French pieces through the 40s with Dutilleux and saint can and Messiaen, all as more sort of concours, different styles there. But I think that when we are talking about performing with expression in a detailed way as flutist, a huge part of that is this French romantic plus 20th century group of styles. So Debussy, Ravel, and Tambour being so important, of course, as well. And, and so I often do think about this a lot. That's where we use the tonal richness on the instrument. We use shadings, syrinx being a major example that I think we all know and love. But, but just if you're starting that out, it just brings up everything that we've been talking about, right, in terms of the, the mood. <laughs> yeah. That would be one example where we bring a lot of these techniques in to make it extremely expressive. And in some sense, this is where this idea of timbre and color, but also the idea of freedom in music comes in. Because as, as we all know, there's a lot of music that's supposed to sound free. And I think that this is connects with the idea of cadenza, the idea of improvisation. It's very fundamental to music itself. And so it is one part of expression that I wanted to mention both in my own work as a performer, but also in my teaching, because I think the question is, okay, I'm studying it really hard. I'm trying to really imbibe what's on the page. How do I now sound free? Mm -hmm. And and so I think you hear that in WC, his rhythms themselves evoke freshness and improvisation. So in a way, by being literal, you can get to the freedom and, and try to convey that. I think in music that literally is out of tempo, for example, little cadenzas in even more modern music, such as in Dutio Sonatin, a huge part of interpretation is thinking about repetition and variety. Because I think mm-hmm. just like in everyday speech, if you say something twice, it's for a reason. Is it mm-hmm. more emphatic? Is it questioning those kinds of things. So I think the idea of rhetoric and speech as well as song can influence us. For example, if I'm going to play those little short condenses in, in Dutia, uh that start, I might just play them um, and talk through them because you were interested in the process, right? So let's say I'm starting here and I'm going to do this. <sighs> So that was in many ways somewhat literal. He, he invites kind of fantastical approach there, but then it happens again, one half step higher. And so then that's when you think, okay, I'm not going to play it the same way. I'm going to change a little bit the pacing of what I'm doing. I won't necessarily give it away, but I kind of remember what I just did. And I'm going to change it around a bit in terms of the speed of some of the elements. Mm-hmm. 
It's not a bad Friday afternoon when Mimi Stillman is playing in your earbuds. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Heidi. Yeah, so it was just kind of one example of this idea of capturing freedom from the composer in interpretation by making some changes in pacing and just sort of very consciously thinking about where you're headed and uh, not doing the same thing twice. Yeah. And again, you know, knowing the theory behind it, you said it's a half step higher, you mm -hmm. know, and so there's more intensity there. And then how, how are you going to convey that as an artist? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So it's just one little example of the process. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. And going back to, um, I know this seems a little off topic, but um, the gold nugget that I want to pull going back to those Monet paintings, right? You brought up this really neat memory that I completely forgot that I used to do um, during my tech days. I would turn on YouTube and um, turn on the NASA video camp. And they have like these beautiful pictures of the planets and just having the planets and the pictures through the screen in the background. And you're looking at it as you're playing repertoire. I don't know. I don't know why I'm bringing that up other than it helps to visually maybe encapture mm -hmm. something grand and bigger than us, you know, into I, the music. Oh, that must have been so great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I love that anecdote, Heidi. That's, it's so creative. And, and I think that really speaks to this question of expression itself. So I kind of just gave a few examples of my thought process and about capturing the style of each composer, of each piece, of each moment and making those decisions. But part of this is really where you can't explain it, right? Music has this power to move people, to move us, to move the people we play for, hopefully with what we're doing, but it, there's a magic. And so some of it we can talk about very analytically and some of it, I think we can't really fully explain what's happening mm -hmm. in those moments. And I think, I think it's about embracing that and feeling really blessed by that. Um, I know I feel that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we can definitely hear that in your playing and how moved you are by the music you're playing and that magic uh, you definitely created and make the music jump off the page. <laughs> Thank you so much. But yeah, so it, and it's interesting because I think sometimes when people ask me about, you know, how to be expressive or they, they might notice that if it's a live concert and they're seeing me rather than a recording, I move when I play. So body language is part of it. I think sometimes I can't help but feel the music and it probably comes out on my face or in my eyes. And when you were asking about teaching and helping students become more expressive, this is also a little bit, some of it you can describe and some of it, it's, it's, you have to invite them to embrace the magic inside of themselves because sometimes I tell students there might be some parallels with acting here in that when we're playing ebullient music, we want that to kind of show, right? But number one, we want it to sound that way. So I, I, we can't really copy anyone else in terms of their body language or facial expressions. I think it's more about finding how to let those flow through yourself as a performer and become the expressive communicator that you are to the best of your ability. Hmm. Yeah, Carol Winston does a lot of theatrical exercises in the master classes she teaches. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so that was the connection I made there. Yeah, you're definitely right. Finding that unique voice and how to express it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So besides uh, maybe outside of theater and you mentioned, you know, listening to vocalists, are there any other resources that you would like to offer students and teachers alike who want more information on this topic? I think listening widely is some of the best advice I could give and what I do myself. I think that sometimes um, as flutists, we often listen to maybe five or six different interpretations of the piece that we're playing by flutists, but, and that's great, but I think we should also learn from as many different types of performers as possible. So when my students are playing Bach, I have them listen to Bach cello suites and keyboard and violin and cantatas and just everything that they can. I think that really informs us. So I think just listening widely to great 
interpretations. I also really learn a lot from books about music and by composers. So one of my favorite books on music is actually WC on Music. It's Collections of Writings uh, by WC. I'm always bringing him up, him up, right? He's my man over here. But also the, the wonderful Bach book by Sir John Elliott Gardner um, of comment, commentary on Bach cantatas is a standout. But it's really interesting um, to kind of hear musicians talking about music or read biography. So some of some of those resources are really good. I'm reading a really fascinating book right now. It's called Dangerous Melodies by Jonathan Rosenberg. And it's about the intersection of music and politics in America from World War One through the Cold War. And so that's really interesting. And I think the, the point being in terms of this conversation, uh, will it affect how you play an American flute piece during that time? Probably not if you look at measure by measure, but absolutely if you're talking about just becoming the most broad-minded thinkers that we can be as well as flutists and artists. Mm, yes, being informed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on different things, I actually have on my YouTube channel, I put a lot of recordings from concerts. Uh, so in addition to my albums, I also like to share things on YouTube. And there's some pieces, including, you know, just talking about expression. One of the most emotional pieces for me is Amy Beach's Romance, which is originally for violin and piano. And so I arranged it for flute and piano and it's published, but also those recordings are on YouTube. Um, if anyone wants to check it out, just this idea of the line and the vocal quality that we talked about. And I also have a series of tip videos too on various aspects. And I love questions. I, I do a lot of tip videos based on flutist questions. So everyone is welcome to get in touch with me. I do love your tip videos. They are very well constructed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so do you have any, I know COVID is crazy. Do you have any upcoming concerts or virtual concerts that you would like people to know about since you were naming off your channels? I have two uh, recent album releases, which I'm ex very excited about. One of them is Leonard Bernstein's Halil incredibly moving piece um, in the version for flute, piano, and percussion ensemble with Philip O'Banion leading the Philadelphia Percussion and Piano Project. That was a lot of P's, but that's the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> the Temple University Percussion Ensemble and then my duo buddy, Charlie Abramovic on piano um, is now out. And then also out is uh, David Sirkin Ludwig, my Curtis classmate and great friend, great composers, three anchorist songs uh, with Matthew Levy, saxophone excellent colleague and leader of uh, Prism Saxophone Quartet on an album called The Anchorist. So those are a couple of recent things. Um, and I have other recital CDs with a lot of repertoire and Dolce Suono Trio CDs. And recently just had a wonderful experience playing with Charlie, my duo pianist again for the first time in, I guess, just about seven months. Um, mm -hmm. We recorded a recital on his porch that's going to be released November 15th by Haverford College Concert Artist Series. So it was really great to do that and there'll be there'll be some more my Dolce Swin Ensemble is also going to do some socially distant uh, lots of safety protocols recordings but at least we'll get to play together and we'll get to share some chamber works with everyone oh cool so when everything gets launched and put out there um, feel free to send me any links and I want to make sure the listeners have easy access to those performances <gasps> Definitely, Heidi. You know, I could send you the links to my website and social media so people can click through if that sounds good. That sounds amazing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. as, a, as a podcast host, I have learned a huge lesson and that is um, to offer another space of any public announcement that you would like to make. A lot of times I'm like, oh, okay, it's been a great show. Thank you so much. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> I want to oh, say yeah. something else. And so I want to give you space to say anything that's on your heart. It can be on the oh. topic of expression, you know, that we've been talking yeah. about now, or if it's something that, you know, is on, mm -hmm. on the front of your mind. Yeah. A couple more quick thoughts, if you want, on the on the expressive part, because I was thinking that in addition to the the aspect of the, the full package of the performance visually with body language and, and expression, as well as how it sounds being so fundamental, naturally, um, for me, memorizing my music helps me feel freer to express it. And it's something that I encourage my students to do as well. Um, and it's it's a great skill within the skill of playing. Um, and so that's part of it. And I think 
think also from a standpoint of viewing a performance, um, when you see that the performer, even if there's a music on the stand there is more referring to the music than reading every note, that creates a more emotional experience. I think that helps audience connect with the performer on stage. So uh, the memorization part is part of this. And I think also when thinking about interpreting a piece or being expressive, if it really comes from a holistic approach to the music f from the why of what we're doing. You ask, you know, what am I going to do here and why, or what is the composer asking me to do? Then it kind of really shows a path. And then I think sometimes I've noticed students ask me, or they might like my interpretation of something, and then they ask how they should interpret it. And I say, really, it should absolutely emanate from study of the, of the composer. And so that you could see what he or she is asking you to do, because you're always going to be yourself there. I think the music is always going to be filtered through our persona, our psyche, our mood on that day. So if anything, it's about inviting that and inviting the joy or the range of moods of the music to happen rather than trying to be expressive, I think is another part of approaching that. And I did actually bring something that really inspires me. Actually, two quotes I brought from Leonard Bernstein, and I'm just going to grab it. Music can name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. So I think this is absolutely summing up this idea of um, we as communicators and people who express music get to partake in something magical um, that in some ways is very hard to put into words. And that's actually what Gustav Mahler, one of my favorite composers, said also in his quote, if a composer could say what he had to say in words, he would not bother trying to say it in music. Mm, I love that. I love that one too. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and, thank you for bringing those yeah. quotes. <laughs> My pleasure. I often get inspired by quotations by thinkers. And and I really appreciate the invitation to say anything else. And I just wanted to just take a moment to thank you again so much for having me on your wonderful podcast, Heidi. And it's just been such a pleasure talking to you and getting to know you a little bit better during our chat part as well. Um, but I just wanted to say to everyone out there who's a flutist or musician or lover of music that I want to wish you a lot of joy in your musical journey for yourself and for communicating this joy and this love for music to others. Mm. Well, the pleasure has been all mine and I cannot thank you enough for your time, talents and energy and just sitting down and sharing with us, you know, this music world <laughs> that we're <laughs> all a part of. And you are such an expressive player and such a giving person. And we, we can see that so easily. And I say that because you're a treat to all of us. And so I thank you. Thank you so much. That's so meaningful to me. And I can't wait to see you again in person at some point, hopefully soon. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.